So welcome anyone to another episode of the Handball Movement Podcast. There's a special guest with me today. It's Daniel Birkelon from Norway. Hi, Daniel. How are you? Hello, Andrea. Very good. Nice to be here. Looking forward to it. Yeah, it's great. I'm really happy to have you here. So uh, for those who didn't came across your work and particularly who you are and what you do, can you give us a bit of a insight about your work and your experience? Sure. Uh, I'll try to do the the quick and easy version. Um, 42 year old uh, handball coach from Norway. I've been a handball person my, my whole uh, life. Uh, ever since I started playing myself when I was a kid. Um, I used to say that uh, that I was uh, never a good player, so I had to be, uh, I was a bad player, so I had to become a coach. I started coaching quite early. Um, coached my first team when I was uh, 15, 16 years old, I think. And I've uh, been staying with it ever since. Uh, working full-time with handball for the last 20 years. Uh, in a lot of different capacities, um, on the club level, uh, in different roles. First as an assistant coach and a youth coach. Then I worked uh, seven years in the Norwegian Federation, uh, working as a coach on the junior and youth national teams, uh, and also working a lot with player development and player education. And now for the last seven years, since 2014, I've been working professionally as a, as a coach uh, on the senior level. I've been coaching uh, teams both on the men's side and the women's side uh, in the top league in, in Norway. Um, and uh, last uh, this, uh, this season, I was in Hungary, uh, part of the coaching staff in Shiofak for five, six months. Uh, and uh, now I will go to Sweden the next next year. Uh, and also I'm still uh, doing some project work for the Norwegian Federation. I'm uh, part of the management group for the Norwegian Master Coach course and also uh, working on some development project for the Federation. So it's a lot of humble in my life. Yeah, you're really busy. So I'm really happy that you <laughs> find some time to, to have a chat with me and with us in this podcast. I think it's really important. So we're trying to uh, talk about uh, creativity and new things and projects and to share something with all the people who will join this podcast. So thank you very much. Um, uh, let's go deep into uh, something about your, your personal experience. And so what is your coaching philosophy what you're looking for when you when you develop players when you grow players yeah it's that's a great question uh and i think uh, it's a question that could be a podcast on its own you know it we, we can uh, could discuss and talk about that for, for for a lot of time i think uh no first of all i, I would say that i'm very uh, for me I, I need to understand you uh, as a player and as a person if we're going to achieve something together I'm extremely focused on development. I want to improve some small percentage every day. That goes for myself, but also for my players. And I really believe in the value of, of hard work every day and that our success is sort of the accumulation of, of all these many, many small steps, all these details. Um, I also try to, I say that I try to be curious, creative and courageous in my coaching. And for me, that means that I try to sort of push the limits, don't just do tomorrow what we did yesterday and, and think that that will be enough, but instead always be on the move, always thinking, always searching for some new and better ways to do things uh, and kind of exploring uh, all these different aspects of, of humble coaching and, and development within. Um, also, so uh, some other key words for me uh, in my coaching philosophy are responsibility and ownership. I, th I think that the player needs to own the process uh, when it comes to his or her individual development and so on. It's not, it's not me who, who is going to be a better player. It's the player who is going to be better. And to achieve that, the player needs to really take part of it. Yeah. Um, and, and if we go, if we talk more about coaching philosophy in terms of sort of the methodical approach that I, I think we will discuss more uh, today, um, I would say, I think it's fair to say that I'm very sort of handball oriented, handball focused. 
And, and what I mean by that is that I want all my training methods to have a connection to the game of handball. Uh, yeah. I, the, the game asks the question in terms of the, in terms of the different challenges we need to uh, try to solve. And by analyzing and understanding the game, we can find the answers we need. And from there, try to develop the necessary methods and uh, that we need to, to, to develop what needs to be developed uh, to, need, to meet the demands of the game situation. And so, so, so even when we're doing things that are far from handball specific per se, let's say that we're lifting some heavy squats in the gym, which is also yeah. something that I have my players do. I, I still want to really be able to draw a line from that to the humble skills. I want to be able to uh, make an argument from a humble context why I think we need to do these uh, squats. So, so for me, everything starts uh, starts in the in the game and in the yeah in the game of humble. Yeah. So, um, based on your experience, what kind of problems do you think are the biggest one that the, the players are facing? So, uh, you, you already mentioned that you want to help them with the understanding of the game and to try to put the game as much as, and the requirements of the game as much as possible inside uh, the training session and the training plan, the training development. So, um, do you think there are other aspects that today are big problems that the, yeah, for the athletes they are missing and we have to fill with our job as a coaches? Well, I think if we if we focus on on the sort of topic that we are discussing on on this uh, this podcast, I think that there are there are basically two questions for me that uh, and they are also very closely connected uh, in many ways and they influence influence uh, each other. And yeah. the first thing, I, uh, as I see it, is the is the problem with injuries. Uh, I. Th- for me, it's obvious that handball as a sport has a great challenge uh, in this area. We, I think we see far too many injuries of all sorts and on all different levels. Uh, and I think that all of us, uh, we have a responsibility to address this in a better way than, than we are, have been able to do so far. Yeah. Uh, of course, one aspect there is sort of the, the political part of it, especially if you talk about the top international level. Uh, the number of games for the top players and and yeah. all these these things of it, um, but but I also think that we as coaches we have to res, uh, rec- recognize our responsibility for the health uh, for the health of our players uh, both when it comes to the sort of acute injuries, yeah. twisting an ankle, tearing a ligament or whatever, and perhaps especially when it comes to the sort of injuries that occur over time due to workload uh, failure. Yeah, um, And and I think that b- bottom line is that injured players don't play, injured players don't uh, win games, and injured players don't improve and develop. So so minimizing the the risk and the, and the frequency of injuries is in many ways the most one of the most valuable things we can do to make better players uh, and through that win more games. So that that's that's sort of one aspect, one one approach to it. Uh, the other key question, I would say, is if we it's about performance. Was it what is it that needs to be developed if you want to be a good humble player? Uh, what is it that the players need to be able to do and how does this path from from zero competence from low competence to the top level uh, competence look like uh, what's what's the different steps the player needs to take throughout this this learning process what are the sort of different components that we need to put in place uh, and for me when when I I really like to kind of dive a little bit into these things dig a little bit and and be a little bit uh, ner- nerdy about these things i think they're really interesting questions um and i have over the years tried to sort of develop my thinking and my methods on how we develop humble skills and and what humble skills are uh, and of course I'm, I'm not alone on this i think we've seen a lot of interesting development uh, in humble training over the last let's say 10, 15 years. And I, I really believe that there is a lot more to come over the next uh, 10 years. I think that we, that we will continue to, to change and, and 
think differently on how we are coaching our players uh, over the next yeah, five to ten years. Um, yeah, so I couldn't agree more for uh, <laughs> for what it counts, my point of view. But I mean, I work a lot with movement and prevention with my athletes and that what I'm currently still doing and what I did in the past. And I have mm-hmm. exactly the same vision. So I think, you know, an injured player can play and an injured player, it's also affecting the cost of the club at a higher level because then you have to take care of the rehabilitation. Yep. Uh, so there are many, many uh, aspects that then comes in into play when you have to deal with injured players and problem becomes bigger and bigger. If you have many of them, it's maybe an unlucky season that it would be disastrous for uh, all the interest of the club in terms of performance and costs. So I, yep. I really agree. Um, so you did develop something uh, using your uh, ideas, your creativity, uh, trying to answer these questions. So what the athletes need and what we can do as a coaches to help them improve both on uh, prevention and athletic point of view and technical and tactical aspects. So you create some uh, exercise that you define crossover exercise. Uh, would you give us an explanation about it? And then maybe we can also show something on the video recording of uh, this. Exercise. Yeah, sure. Sure. I would be, I would be happy to uh, No, because one, one aspect of this that I, tend to focus more and more uh, and has been kind of trying to explore uh, over the last I don't know three four five six eight ten years or whatever is is this what I call sort of trying to connect the dots a little bit covering this gray area uh, yeah. between what you could define at the more basic physical uh, abilities let's say being strong being fast having good eye hand uh, uh, eye hand coordination that sort of stuff and uh, the the handball specific skills and and try to uh, try to understand how we can work in handball specific context with developing the physique that we need on the handball court how we can combine some of the physical and technical training to get an even better transfer between between the two um, and, and through that get more effect of what we are doing in humble situations. Um, and also how we can use uh, methods from our humble training toolbox uh, to build the different physical abilities. So it sort of goes a little bit both ways. Uh, so yeah, I prepared some, um, just some uh, few examples that I would be yeah. uh, really happy to, to show and we can, uh, we can discuss it. So if yeah, you definitely. Give so me the... for all the people who are listening here, we have, uh, of course, the podcast will be shared in all the platforms to be heard in audio form. But then in the future, we are going also to uh, share it on uh, Facebook. So there's a chance now to see uh, some of the work of uh, Daniel uh, also visually. Yeah. So um, I prepared, I think I have uh, four slides or something. Uh, first here, uh, just uh find uh, just two different examples yeah of of what i would call uh, kind of yeah crossover training connecting the dots a little bit uh, and and here we are as you see we're working we're working a lot on power we're working on explosiveness but we're doing it in a humble uh, context yeah at the same time we're definitely working on on technical details and to kind of automate uh, both the movement quality that that the player is doing, what she wants to do at the top quality every time, and doing it with maximum maximum power every time, so that that so that her body kind of recognizes and remembers that this is sort of the this is the uh, snap that she she wants. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, I will just show you the other one here it's a little bit the same just really simple exercises nothing very fancy about it but really paying attention to details and being very particular how we design the drills what are the details that we're looking for uh, and how do we want it to to be performed yeah. So uh, what we are seeing we here in the speak? video are players uh, in the video of Daniel of recordings of uh, his trainer of uh, the yeah the, the past seasons are players who are taking just just individual shooting it's individual technique but is mixed with some uh, specific movement 
or something that can be it is related to uh, the jumping part of the movement and then the explosiveness of the shot or in this case uh, quick foot abilities and a bit of change of direction balance so all the things are involved in this uh, mixed training so this it was just to give a bit of a uh, overview for uh, the people who are just listening um, yeah great great absolutely correct uh, and then I took just to show sort of you uh, uh, show you that it's it's not uh, just on about the top level players because on, on this first slide the, the player you saw there was a player called Tamara Horacek, a French girl who is now playing in Schiofak in Hungary so that's yeah. sort of the top level. Yeah, it's, it's on the top international level uh, but I also think that this sort of training, these ideas uh, also can be very useful when we are uh, working with, with younger players. So yeah. here I have two videos from these girls, uh, these uh, players, it's, bo it's both uh, girls and boys. They are uh, 14, 13, 14 years old in this video. Yeah. Uh, and and here it's it's a little bit about um, it's about learning different uh, the different technical skills. And yeah. what I experience with these kind of uh, drills is that we're we we are able to learn the players the how they should move uh how the humble movement should be in a sort of in a very effective and also intuitive way because the it's, it's sort of the drills that are uh the drills are teaching the players uh without without we uh, so that we as coaches we don't need to kind of instruct them too much in everything because if the because the if we set up the drills correctly make sure that the distance between the the sort of tools we are using and everything is is uh, is uh, the correct way they will uh, gradually do the techniques in a in a proper and, and good yeah. and effective way uh, so so for me i think when you're working with younger younger humble players this is a really good way to sort of to add into the mix with let's say the more traditional technical training where we are explaining the players okay now you put your left foot here and now you go to the right yeah. and then blah 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 uh, and i also think that as i, as I wrote there, i also think that we get a lot of sort of uh, uh, handball specific movement elements handball specific coordination the players uh, uh, get to work with sort of the awareness of space the balance the rhythm and high coordination and uh, eye foot coordination and, and so forth yeah there is there is definitely a lot of uh, truth in what you say and what you're experimenting also from the uh, scientific point of view i research it often and it, it has been shown uh, if we that this kind of uh, exercitations, they have positive effect both on youth athletes and elite athletes for two different reasons, but they both have positive transfer. So for transfer, we uh, define the ability of an exercise to give us a positive impact on what is our performance. So in this case, handball, uh, playing handball. So we have in let's say two uh, fields in this kind of uh, observation that we are doing. So the athletical field, the athletical point of view that for the athletes to master, so to be fast, powerful, uh, quick and have awareness and the technical and tactical part. So for the youth categories in their development, the more broader is the experience that we can give them, the better it is. And there is a high percentage of uh, learning also in quality of what they do uh, when they are youth. So between 12 till they're 18, uh, just giving them uh, as much experience as we can of different things to do. So this kind of combined work work for that. And then what happened is that we all know that as soon as the athletes becomes uh, older or they just achieve a higher level we all say training has to go into specific because it's just normal that you know it's become harder and harder to have the same positive effect doing the same things but it has been shown mm. that now giving some stimulus that is different it will provide also a positive effect on their uh, development so this kind of exercitation mm. can be both applied for really youth and older and expert at least, just knowing why and what are we doing, you know, how it's the proper way to apply these things, we can still have a positive effect. So it's a really interesting thing because it leaves a lot of space also to creativity. And as you said, then yeah. if you set up the exercise properly, 
uh, the athletes with volume and repetition is sort of, you know, brought into the right direction. And for the coach also, it's just exactly. easy then to be exactly. able to point out, all right, now focus on this, focus on that, while they're just performing the whole exercise. So it's a really proficient way to, uh, yeah, create, manage your training, and also give this vast experience to the player of all this complex movement because handball is really, really complex sport to play. Exactly. Exactly. And, and actually what you're saying there is, is uh, actually a really good uh, sort of a bridge in, into the next uh, sort of sub, um, yeah. subtopic or that I wanted to discuss a little bit or, yeah. and show some example of is that what I said, that purpose is everything in, in selecting and designing drills. Uh, and here I've just uh, chose, uh, I just uh, find two uh, small, uh, two, two different uh, drills that in, in many ways on the, on the distance, they can look a little bit similar. Yeah. Uh, but, but the devil's in the details. So my point is that on, on the left there, uh, turn on the sound there. Uh, on the left there you see sort of uh, classical uh, movement uh, some quick feet uh, speed ladder some low hur hurdles uh, type of work and uh, this is part of uh, a warm-up drill that we did in uh, with these players in in, in Shiofok. yeah uh, and my point there is that if i think i see that many many times we as coaches we use this type of things we see okay this looks cool this looks fun so we apply it on our players and we think that we are training humble specific uh, if you if i do this that you see on the left side here i don't see it as humble training because then i would need my players to move very differently because the, the movements they're doing here are not humble movements it's not it's not an effective way uh, to move if we're talking about, uh, for example, moving uh, effectively with your feet in the defense or, or whatever. But uh, I still think that this is a great uh, tool to include as a part of the training, uh, of the training yeah. because, the, because the point here is not to train the player's uh, uh, humble technique. The point here is to train the player's ability to uh, learn quickly, to adjust quickly to, to different circumstances. Uh, to give them always a little bit new uh, movement uh, challenge. Yeah. Uh, and and that's, that's why it's so important that we as coaches, we need to understand, we need to know what is the purpose, what, why are we doing what we are doing. And then I can sort of, if I move from, from the video on the left there to, to on the right there, uh, it's, it's still movement, but here we are more, here we are very humble specific. So here yeah, we're so seeing a, a sort of defensive in... movement, and then there is a, as a yeah. fast break from the player who runs on the on the sidelines, basically. So we what we are seeing here, that what Daniel gave us in a video example, it's on the left uh, of our screen. There was before just um, warm up uh, exercitation with all the team, where they're just warming up with uh, speed ladders and hurdles, you know, skills skills for the quick agilities. And on the right, uh, what Daniel is trying to tell us, we can also train these same things also uh, including more specific field movement. Yeah, because, so here, because here we're, we're putting, the, the, putting the movement into handball specific context. Yeah. And, and here we really know what we're looking for. We're trying to simulate, this is a wing player in defense. We're trying to simulate the movements that she had in our sort of system uh, in, yeah. in defense, how we wanted to play. We're trying to include some small technical details where is her arms uh, to kind of how 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 do you how does she need to use her arms to to maybe steal the ball if it's coming and and these things and then adding this sh uh, short sprint at the end to simulate the transfer from defense to counter attack yeah. so first she needs to work da -da 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 in defense and then boom we have the ball and she has to run uh, yeah. so uh, so again purpose is everything we need to we need to be very particular, I think, as coaches about are we working uh, with things that we want to do on the humble court or is the idea something else? And yes. there's no nothing wrong with doing 
non-specific things, doing things that are not similar to Humble, but you know, you need to know why you are doing it. What is it that I want to achieve by by uh, applying this this drill uh, to my players? Precisely. I think this is also very important, uh, not just at the very top level, but also to, <laughs> I'm dealing a lot with not, not professional clubs, you know, and sometimes people come to me and say, oh, I saw these really cool things on videos. Yeah. I saw yeah. really cool things of this important coach. Yeah, they're really cool things. But the question is, why are they doing it? You know, so exactly, what is the exactly, purpose exactly. of what we are seeing? It's this just something that they fought specifically for this player is something that is in a particular moment of the season, you know, at the, at the very top level, you have a whole staff of person because there's the head coach, the second coach, the conditioning coach, maybe you have physiotherapy person. So there's a whole bunch of people who are working together, possibly with purpose going in the same direction. Uh, when at the very lower level, we just have someone who have to deal with everything and maybe doesn't even have all this broad knowledge. So the very question is always why, as you're saying. So, why are we doing yeah, this? Yeah, that's that. That's 100% correct, and, and a really important point. And I think, as you say, it's it's even it's even a more important discussion uh, to, when we are talking about a little bit lower level or or youth humble, because there there you you are, you are normally more alone and and more difficult to kind of know what you need to do and where what is the component that we need to to apply on on uh, at, at the moment yeah so yeah be, be be very specific about always always think always try to have a good answer on the question why why are we doing it why is this a good idea it's not enough that the drill is cool uh, it needs to have a, a clear purpose for for yeah. your players and and that we, that we want to achieve something with this it with will this help drill. you both for you know taking care of the personal need of one single player because then you start to ask yourself okay um what we have to do to help him in his position uh, regarding defense or offense. And then you can start to answer yourself about technical and athletical point of view, but also from the whole collective point of view, because then you ask, okay, why do I want my team to play this way? You know, and all these things. So the same example that you just show us, it was beautiful because it's, if you just see the video, it's a really simple drill because there's no equipment involved. There's just a player moving mm -hmm. on the field, but it's the contest yeah. that is the content that is really dense. Yeah. So she has been yeah. instructed on, uh, what is what are the, her duties in the positioning? What she's required to do yeah. in defensive movement? Why does she have to move her body that way, hands and legs? And then why are yeah. we doing this exercise? So there is first a defensive requirement and then an offense transition. So it's fantastic yeah. because just being uh, aware of the why we are doing things, we don't need so much in terms of equipment and stuff. No. We just need to yeah, put attention and know what you are, uh, how can we enrich the exercise for the, for the players? So to give her the knowledge yeah. of what she, in this case, because she was a woman, but what the players are doing. Exactly. And if I just use this, go, I can go a little bit further actually on this example, because um, yeah, this, this drill that you're seeing here, it, it, uh, it came as a result of uh uh, discussion conversation uh, with the player. Uh, yeah. We analyzed together some games. Uh, she was struggling a little bit with her defense play. We tried to go into the situations really analyzed and very deep on an individual, technical, tactical level. Okay, you 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 don't you feel you're struggling, and we see that uh, that we get a little bit too many goals on, on, in your sector, yeah. how can we solve it? What, what is the, in, in, instead of just, ah, I suck in defense, we try to kind of understand what is missing and how can we solve it? Uh, and we try to work with that, of course, in different types of training, uh, of, uh, of, all the way from the, when we're working six against six in the big tactical trainings to the more, um, the more isolated situation trainings, but also going all the way down here with no attacker, no ball, just just uh, getting repetitions on the movements, on the techniques. And for those of you who are watching um, the video, for example, pay attention to her left arm is one key detail that we wanted to work, that when she's working down here to activate her left arm to make it a little bit more difficult for the back player to play to the wing. 
So yeah. that's sort of the the detail level oh, that we're working on on yeah. here. On, with, 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 with He's the, creating with the movement to so be we... uh, aggressive on the passing lines, basically on the pass lines. Yes, yes. And and the point is that I want her in in when we get in the game situation, I don't want her to think about okay i need to i need yeah. to remember to activate my left arm i want the left arm to be there automatically so that's why we kind of <clears throat> rep, uh, repeat this this different uh, technical movements try to repeat it a lot of times uh, so that the body remembers without thinking yeah so that yeah. it goes uh, it's in her backbone that when you're there your your arm is moving to to cover this uh, this passing line yeah that's great. Uh, yeah. Do we have so, another uh, video, have, Daniel? Yeah, I have a last. Uh, I have a last. Yeah. Uh, one more example, uh, or, or sort of, um, yeah, one more aspect that I yeah. wanted to to show you. Um, now here I'm, I'm moving a little bit uh, over to um, uh, endurance training, where, which is also um, an an interesting uh, area, I think, and and an area where I really have changed a lot of my approach uh, over the last. Yeah, five to five to eight years. Um, okay. In in Norway, we have sort of a, we have a lot of tradition to, for the uh, traditional way of uh, thinking about endurance. That we we yeah, we have a good culture of training. We are so we are used to putting on our uh, our running shoes, going outside in the summer, running our uh, long trips, running our intervals, our four minute intervals, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but what I've sort of my opinion about this has sort of gradually changed a lot because when I see the research that we have on handball, you see that sort of the the demands on the um, on the VO two max uh, for a handball player is relatively low, even on top level. So, uh, so I I think that we probably don't need that much on this kind of basic uh, endurance capability. So I think that endurance in handball is a little, it's something else because it's a lot about repeating, uh, uh, repeating explosive moment, movements. It's a lot about, uh, of course, about body contact. Uh, and it's a lot about working really hard for quite uh, short period of time, then having a short rest and then repeating it. Yeah. So here are just two. Here are just two different ideas that I use uh, nowadays. That I, I I use this these type of ideas much more than I use uh, than I send my players outside to run without uh, without the ball or without doing humble movements. So on the on the left there you see uh, sort of uh, a course yeah. that uh, that we're doing uh, where the idea is that we are. Um, including a lot of humble similar movements uh, we are adding a lot of change of direction uh, a lot of jumps a lot yeah. of explosive uh, explosive movements a lot of lot of acceleration and deceleration um, and trying to uh, trying to make a course that gives the player uh, uh, that um, uh, that they are able to to maintain uh, top quality in their movements all the way throughout. So it shouldn't be too long, but it should of course be long enough that that it gives uh, the the stress that we want. Yeah. Um, and I, I my experience is that this this type to this type of courses um, it can be it's a very can be a very effective way to work on. We uh, when I work like this, I I set up this course. And we do somewhere between four to six uh, repetitions of it. And that's enough, I think. It takes yeah. maybe 15 minutes uh, or, or, or something like that, 10, 10, 12, 15 minutes, depending a little bit. And, and I think you get a great uh, endurance um, effect of it. Yeah. Uh, that can be a, a really useful way to train also endurance for handball uh, without just going out for a run, you know, exactly, try to exactly. use the repetition uh, in time or in number of repetition. That's how you prefer to, to build up your training, I guess, uh, you, utilizing lateral movement, little jump, sprinting. So and the accumulation of this stimuli will, yes. will give us the specific yeah. endurance required for the yeah. game. Yeah. And I think this ability to do all these different things is more um, 
it's more relevant for a handball player than kind of the more traditional running training where you are running on a stable uh, heart rate for this amount or this amount uh, because handball is not like that I think uh, uh, on, on the right there my, my last example uh, yeah. which is a little bit different approach to endurance is also something that I do uh, a lot and especially uh, do a lot in season to kind of maintain our our endurance maintain yeah. our uh, our stamina uh, is uh, uh, just to use the handball uh, here we are doing uh, just uh, yeah quite a classic counter attack counter defense movement uh, this is a really high intensity training it's really demanding yeah. we're playing we're running three against three uh, all when you have field. Uh, yeah yeah, yeah, and when you have done the counter attack, you have to run home. And there are, as you see, there are basically two groups on each team. So you you are you're running up one time, you're running back, and then you have one time rest, and then you go again. Yeah. So uh, basically, if I can see properly, we have uh, the team is split in two groups of six yes. players, yeah. and they are alternatively playing three against three. So you yeah. first have one way where you have to do a, a fast break attack and then you yeah. have to defend and then I guess you yeah. can rest a moment and the new three players are coming in attacking against the three who just uh, brought the attack on the other team so you always have to do an attack and a defense consecutively and then you have exactly. a brief moment of rest and then you have to perform again so it's a really high intense uh, interval uh, requirement yep. for if you want to see it only from the physical point of view but the fact is this is game specific because the girls here are playing uh, what you require them to play play fast exactly. ball and have first uh, you know an offensive action and then immediately recovering with a defensive action exactly and and i think that uh, one one, uh, one point here uh, one thing here that i want to point out is that yeah when, when i see when i see these type of training being used I think my uh, argument would be that I think a lot of coaches, maybe especially a lit on the little bit lower level, are underestimating how demanding this is. Uh, because that, that I, is I, brutal. I see sometimes, <laughs> it's a brutal I, exercise. I, I see sometimes coaches that you, you put you set up this exercise and you and you let it go for five, six, eight minutes. And what happens then is, of course, the speed and the quality will go down because yes. it's impossible. It's, it's a really hard exercise. So when I do this, and even here, these are top international players. Yeah. We do it for periods of um, maybe th three, maximum four minutes. Yes. When we are kind of in a, top, in a top shape and really want to push it, we can go for four minutes. And I do it... Uh, if I go for four minutes, I will maybe have a two-minute rest between each, and I will do three, could do four, but uh, normally only three periods. So, so it's uh, I, I'm very particular because when I do this, I'm, it's very important for me that we get the quality. We, I don't want my players to train at, uh, to be getting used to running at the lower speed. I yeah. also and I for sure don't want them to train at throwing away the ball. So I, I need to kind of find that exactly sweet spot where it's really demanding, but it's just within what they can, uh, what they can uh, cope with. Yeah. How, wh how, uh, yeah. That's a great point. So we're going again on the, on, on the why we do, uh, we are doing things. So in your case, you're saying, okay, yeah. let's say uh, best, scenario i can do two rounds of four minutes each with a in, uh, with a break in between if there are yeah. some things that i can notice that it is we're playing fast we're not losing the ball yeah. so the quality of the game is acquired yeah. and i can notice also that the girl are not getting extra tired for the exercise so if all these things are yeah. in place best scenario i can run it for two rounds of four minutes but the, the focus is not just to run fast and it, there are exactly. all these components exactly. who have to be in place. So, of course, the yeah. uh, extraneous level of the exercitation, because it's, it's, it's hard and they have to play fast. But also, we don't want to train them just to run and then don't keep the control of the no. ball. We have to play fast and good. And we have to score and don't throw the balls yes. all around the places. So, and that's the yes. thing. So, that's a good tip also for people, the, the majority of the people who are not dealing with top athletes, that sometimes we just require also our youth categories just to run 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 like crazy horses in the gym yes, uh, but yes. we should just also yeah. 
keep in mind that if they can handle the ball, they, 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 they can better than do athletics, right? So <laughs> there is also a ball to manage. Exactly, 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 exactly. That's a really good point. And I would rather kind of, yeah, and, and I would rather if, if I feel that, uh, okay. and of course it's, it's a balance because as they get tired, the quality might drop a little bit and yeah. I can maybe live with a little bit of drop. And, and then I will kind of try to coach my players that, okay, now, now this is really the point. Now we really have to focus, be really sharp mentally now yeah. because now we're tired. Now, now yeah. we, now we are training to be in the that's last five minutes of the of game. The game. So, so that, that's also part of it. Yeah. So, but they will come to a certain point where I feel that, okay, now we're over this. Now we're over the point th that I can accept. accept. Yeah. So then I would rather stop it a little bit early and say, okay, that's fine. That's where we are. Okay. At this point, uh, three minutes is our, is our limit. So, okay. Then we work there and maybe over time we can also have that as sort of a, a parameter that we can sort of uh, measure that, okay, if, if we, in this drill, we see that now over time we are able to, to keep the quality a little bit longer and a little bit longer. That, yeah. for me, uh, to put it this way, that tells me a lot more than than putting them through a beep test or, or whatever. Uh, because analyzing what they can do on the handball court in handball situations in a very demanding high-intensity handball drill, that's the best parameter I can get. That's really, uh, really uh, useful information. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's... Uh... Yeah, at, at the very elite level, if if you have the whole staff, uh, the whole group of people and experts who can really, you know, follow the same direction, that become a, a really amazing work. Because of course, you need to know, you need to test the player, you need to do uh, pure conditional exercise at a certain point of the season. But then there is a point where the two worlds have, they have to meet. They are not they are not separated yeah, yeah. because we need those players to yeah. run to play good handball yeah. especially at any level but especially at your top level so of course we know there's a, a minimum level that they need to have but from there on it's all using that to play handball so it, yeah. it's yeah. really it's really putting these things together and that's and, and, and these are really good consideration i guess you know it's not just about the exercise itself so because now i'm scared that all the people who can see this they, tomorrow they start to do exactly these things that will, yeah, will happen yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And that's okay but the, the very things, uh, the very important thing to take home from this conversation is to understand why. So you explained really, really good. What are the reasons behind? What are the thoughts behind uh, your preparation in training, and how we can fill these gray areas? How we can uh, compensate, and how can we, yeah, put together the, the athletic requirements and the technical requirements to play qualitative and technical and athletic handball. So. This, these are great, great insight, I think, for anyone at every level, both from the coach point of view, but also I speak to me and my colleagues that we are more uh, athletic conditioned. That, that's also what we need to know. That's also what, where yeah. we need to go with our thoughts too. Uh, there's more than numbers. And of course, they are important, but we have to... Uh, yeah, have this conversation with the coach, especially if you're lucky enough maybe to have a really experienced coach on our side, because mm -hmm. the eye of the coach see things that we have to be able yeah. also to yeah. understand. Yeah, and, and I think that's also uh, that's also an, an important uh, an important uh, point that uh, from from my point of view, when when we have uh, yeah, expertise like like yourself, people who, who kind of come from that that world with that approach, from the more sort of um, physical, um, educated uh, uh, part of it. Uh, where it really starts to be interesting for me is that when we're able to be in a, in a coaching staff, being a coaching team, and kind of. Uh, kind of melt this together having yes. these discussions having these being curious because i i've a lot of these things that i've now talked about and, and that i kind of include in my mythology in my way of working my way of thinking it's things that i've sort of uh, learned from others that i've stolen from from different physical coaches movement coaches uh, research i read and, and all these things uh, and i think it's but it's also really important that that uh physical coach uh, to to put to, to use that term also have the same curiosity and and kind of try, really tries to understand the game of handball and yeah that that we meet uh, to kind of 
uh, to connect these all, all, all these dots. Um, and the kind of the best physical coaches I worked with has had this ability to be really, really curious and, and really asking a lot of questions and trying to understand what, uh, what is the demands of this game. And because it's not like every other game. No. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now that was a, that was a really good conversation. So I guess we are uh, basically at the end of the conversation of today, and that was great. I love to have this this uh, discussion about filling the gray the gray areas, and it was really uh, helpful uh, to see also the your example. So uh, I hope we will have other conversation together, Daniel, where you can give us more insight. Maybe we can discuss then privately what we could talk in the future uh, that could be helpful for all the coaches at any level like we did today so i want to thank you again for your for your time today uh, that was great and uh, i hope to it see you soon so, for another episode it was my pleasure